At this time, we also want to welcome those uh, of you who are joining us online. We're so glad to have you as part of our service this first Sunday in Advent. And because it's the first Sunday in Advent, it is time to light our Advent wreath. So, uh, Gene May and uh, his granddaughter, Ava, uh, will come up to light. We will be reading from Isaiah chapter 9. <coughs> the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let us pray. Lord, as light dispels the darkness, may your light in us give us hope. Hope that you will overcome the darkness of fear and uncertainty in our lives. Hope that you will lead us to your ever-shining eternal kingdom.
year, we're going to do the Christmas doxology. Now, we did that last year. Um, however, it's a different place in our, in our world of worship this year. So, um, you'll certainly know the tune because the tune is a Christmas tree. And uh, the words, most of the words, that we should be pretty familiar. And uh, it uh, is on the inside of your bulletin uh, if you want to follow me or ask me. Thank you. Before I um, have you rise for this gospel reading this morning, I'd like to preface it with a little bit of understanding about it. Uh, this is taken from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Uh, this talks about the, the idea of Jesus being fully God. He's fully human and is a source of our life and our light. God responds to the sin and brokenness of our of the creation by sending his son to overcome the darkness of the world. So the followers of Jesus, us, we, have hope and find hope in Jesus being the eternal word. So if you would please rise. Again, this is the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. The word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And as the reading, please be seated. Chapter 3, uh, beginning of verse 5. 
Micah the prophet, the Old Testament prophet Micah. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets, who we my people stray, you cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against those who put nothing into their mouth. In other words, the prophet was saying there are all these prophets out there. If you pay them, they would give you a good message. If you didn't, they'd give you a curse. Now, that's not the way it's supposed to work. The prophet's supposed to say whatever God wants them to say. And then he goes on and says, Therefore it shall be night to you without vision, and darkness to you without revelation. You see, darkness without revelation. The sun shall go down upon the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. So darkness is this idea where God's not heard. Where God's not. In other words, darkness is where the kingdom of God, where the kingdom of God is not present. And every time we act in selfishness, the world gets a little darker. Every time we act in malice or out of hate in our heart, the world gets a little, it gets darker. It keeps getting darker. Even at Christmas time, in one sense, it's dark. And maybe this is helpful to think of this idea of light and dark, you know, um, because they serve as contrast with one another. John 1 5. Speaking about Jesus, the light came into the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. So that's the darkness. But the Word of God gives us hope. In the middle of the darkness. Because that's what we need. How Lindsay said, how Lindsay said, we can live like 40 days without food. We can live about three days without water. We can live about one, uh, we can live about eight minutes without air. But we can't live one second without hope. I think there's a lot of truth that we need, we need hope. So even in Old Testament times, there are times, there are reasons not to have hope. I mean, think about it. The nation of Israel was, was occupied by the Babylonians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And these were not nice taskmasters. They were evil. They were very oppressive to the Israelites. And they needed, they needed hope. Even our church leaders would not help. Their church leaders had sold out to the ruling authorities and that sort of thing. So they couldn't even get help there. But they needed hope. And, and, and God gave the prophets these words of hope. Now I know we think about it. When we think of the prophets, don't we often think, oh, they just have all these bad things to say. And they do. They do. Here's one of them in Isaiah chapter 5, where, where God, through the prophet Isaiah, speaks of the nation of Israel as a, his grapevine, right? His, his, uh, <laughs> this is what he says. God, the prophet says, God dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice lines. He built a watchtower in the middle of it and hewed out a line back. This is what he did for the nation of Israel. He expected it to yield grace but he yielded wild grapes. In other words, God did all this stuff and Israel didn't respond. Israel responded the wrong way by just being mean and ugly. So the prophet says, and now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Here's the judgment, and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard, I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoped, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. The judgment comes from the prophets. But just a couple pages later, and a couple chapters later, Isaiah 9. Listen to this. The people who walked in darkness have seen great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, 
on them like his shine. There's always that hope. Yes, judgment, but mixed with hope because the people need hope. Because we need hope. 9 6. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulder, and he's been a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So our hope comes in the form of a child. It's our hope that comes to us in, in the form of a child. The child who will rule with all wisdom and power. And that's what God gave hope to the people of Israel for 500 years before that child was born. Because we need hope. It's just look at the world. It stinks. There's so much pain and suffering. But we have hope because of the child. So there's two ways. That child, that child Jesus. We live by hope in Jesus. And there's two ways. One is because, because of what he is doing for us now. The other is because of what he will do. We go back to John 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not overcome it. Why is the darkness not overcome? Because that one, that light, that Christ is Emmanuel. God is with us. And the darkness tried to overcome the light by putting the light on a cross, by killing it. But they couldn't do it. They couldn't overcome the light. Even today, the darkness tries to overcome the light and tries to overcome and do away with churches. And I think it's fascinating. It gives me hope to know that so many churches and so many places like Muslim nations or, or communist nations, they want to get rid of the church entirely. And they haven't been able to do it. The church still survives. Why? They don't have that much power. The darkness doesn't have that much power. Yes, it's everywhere. Five years ago when I did this message, I said that there are places, there are pockets of darkness in this world. I'm sorry, I don't want to get you down, but I'd almost flip it around and say, no, it's dark, but there are pockets of light in this world. There's light. Wherever the kingdom of God is. And, and the darkness can't get rid of it. Remember this verse, James 4, 7. Memorize this verse. Because it's very easy to memorize. But we need it. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's simple. But you see, the point is, we can. We have the power. Because we have a man who all God with us. We can resist the devil and the devil has to flee. Because we have that power. He's a man well, He is God with us. So we have hope because He's with us. But we also have hope because of what He will do. In Mark chapter 13, it talks about when He, Jesus, will come back. Starting in verse 24. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. This sounds scary stuff. But listen to the next few verses. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends. We'll be together. We have hope. Because he's going to overcome all this. He's going to overcome this world. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but when you go back to Isaiah 9, much of Isaiah 9 has not been fulfilled yet. Yeah, the child has come. But think about verse 7. Is a 
authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. There's, there's not nearly endless peace. Meaning that still would be fulfilled. One day when he comes back, that will be fulfilled without we'll peace and prosperity, and he will rule over us in a wonderful sort of way. That's our hope when things get bad. So does that hope shine through you? Do you have that hope? Does the light shine through you into the darkness? Because it just takes a little bit of light and, and people notice. So Carol and I were in Marysville. We had a meeting in Marysville. This was back in October. And by the time the meeting was done, it was dark. And we're coming down a hill off the backside of Marysville. We're coming down a hill, and we come to a cross street. Must be 20 houses on the cross street. I only noticed one of the 20 houses. I didn't really notice the other 19. It was dark. But one house was, I mean, totally decorated for Halloween already. All these lights, it just lit up. My point is, that's the house I noticed. And when we let the light of Christ shine, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. We need to be the bearer of hope, no matter how dark the world gets. One of the darkest times in our nation history was the Civil War. And if you go, there, there is a Battlefield, you go to the battlefield in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Unfortunately, a lot of the battlefield has been eaten up by development, so there's just a small portion of the battlefield, what was the actual battlefield. And, and in one space, it was, in, in my mind, it was one of the saddest days in our nation's history, December the 13th, 1860. It was the day that the Confederates had sort of lined up in a very strong defensive position on Mare's Heights behind a stone wall. And all that day, December 13th, General Ambrose Burnside sent Union troops against it. Just one after another, just to be slaughtered. And some couldn't kind of retreat, some who were still alive couldn't kind of retreat and just lay there in the battlefield. So that the next day through the night and into the next morning when nothing was happening, they could just hear the groans. The morning on the battlefield. That's when a sergeant, a Confederate sergeant, went to his commanding officer and asked if he could go out and help those troops. He wanted to take a white flag of troops. His commanding officer said, you can go, but you can't take the white flag. He's just going to be out there by himself. And Richard Kirkland took several canteens. He went back and forth, actually, from his lines back and forth. Canteen's blankets, remember it's the middle of December, to take care of those Union troops lying in front of the lines. And there's statues at the Fredericksburg um, Military Park, you know, the typical ones of the typical ones of generals and that sort of thing. But there's also a statue there. of the angel of Mare's Heights, laying with a wounded Union soldier with a canteen. Because that's light that shines in the darkness. And that's what we're called to do. You know, everywhere, and especially where there's darkness, we would be those who shine the light. I'm not saying you've got 
that are going to the middle of the battlefield. Even though there are people who are doing that to help other people right now in Ukraine and Gaza and places like that. But how can you shine your light into this dark world? This meal we're getting ready to have. You know, it was a dark day when they crucified our Lord. It was very dark indeed. But three days later, he was raised from the dead so that indeed the light still shone. And may this meal be for us today a reminder that the light of God still shines in the darkness. That we have hope because of this meal and what he has done and that his light may shine through us. We begin with the invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who want us to repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your moral law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. <laughs> Lord, is God. Amen. Amen. The prayer to great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water in the Spirit. It was on the night which Jesus gave himself up for us that he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, Father, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. For this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup again and gave thanks to you, Father. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this cup is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving is a holy and a living sacrifice. And you with Christ offer for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is born of man. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ. 
one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Today will actually be, uh, you'll be served communion in the, in the pews. Um, we'll bring the, the trays around with the uh, bread. We ask that you take the bread and you just hold it, because then we'll all commune together. Uh, the same way when the cup comes around. Just one little war, word of warning with the cups, and that is that sometimes they stick a little bit. So um, just gently rock it out if you can, if you squeeze too hard, they will break. So uh, just, uh, just, uh, just sort of rock it out gently. Uh, and you shouldn't have a problem getting it out. The table said, and it's it's the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a United Methodist table, so you don't have to be United Methodist. It's not St. John's table, so you don't have to belong to this church. Right? This is this is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's ask the ushers to please.
And our final case in this morning is a Christmas version, Christmas version of a familiar song called Your Name. Please stand and join us in the Christmas version of Your Name. world 
that can sometimes be dark. But that's okay. Because we got an angel out. Praise be to God. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.